I'm Mark Crumpton. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Here's a check of First Word News. The U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley, says the Security Council should be ashamed that despite a February 25th ceasefire resolution, violence and suffering continue in Syria. I would ask my Security Council colleagues to consider whether we are wrong when we point to Russian and Iranian forces working alongside Assad as being responsible for this slaughter. Meantime, Russia's ambassador argued his country was the only council member making concrete steps to implement the resolution. Massachusetts could join California in a lawsuit against the Trump administration over the decision to include a citizenship question on the 2020 census. The Democratic Secretary of State called the decision an attempt to suppress the count and frighten voters in states that have large immigrant populations. President Trump floating the idea of using the military's budget to pay for his border wall with Mexico. The Associated Press reports he brought up the idea during a meeting last week with Speaker Paul Ryan. Russian President Vladimir Putin visited a memorial for the victims of the mall fire in Siberia. Thousands of residents rallied in the city today to demand a full investigation into the blaze that killed at least 64 people, many of them children. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. Bloomberg Technology is next. I'm Emily Chang, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, a sell-off in tech stocks pushes down U.S. equities. Why the market volatility is not going away anytime soon. Plus, an important stop on the Zuckerberg apology tour. The Facebook CEO snubs U.K. Parliament but decides to testify on Capitol Hill. And Apple hits Rewind with a new plan to go back to school. We'll put the spotlight on the fight shaping up between two of the tech's biggest players in the classroom coming up. But first, to our lead. Mark Zuckerberg has decided it is time to face the congressional music. The Facebook CEO will appear before the U.S. House Energy and Commerce Committee to answer on Facebook's role in the Cambridge Analytica data scandal. This according to a congressional official familiar with the plans. Zuckerberg has been the subject of criticism from lawmakers on both sides of the aisle. He will not, however, appear before a U.K. parliamentary committee. Now, his decision to appear before Congress hasn't helped Facebook stock very much, which dropped by as much as 4% in trading on Tuesday. That's, of course, on top of the over $90 billion loss Facebook has seen since the scandal broke. To dig deeper into all of this, I'd like to welcome Sarah Fryer, who covers the social network for Bloomberg. And for reaction across the pond, we've got Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde live in London. Sarah, I want to start with you. First of all, Zuckerberg agreeing to testify. I don't believe he's ever spoken before Congress. What do we know about his appearance and what will he say? We know that Zuckerberg has sort of come to terms with the fact that he's going to do this. He said last week, if I'm the right person to answer these questions, I will do it. But I have to be the right person. Congress came back and said, uh, you're the right person. Like, this is like, we want to hear from you. So Zuckerberg has come to terms with that. And, you know, in front of Congress, there are going to be so many questions that Facebook just can't answer. Uh, a lot of questions in particular about where this data has gone that was shared with third party developers back before 2014. Facebook really doesn't know. I mean, they're going to do some audits, but they, they don't have currently the answers to the where are these 50 million user profiles now? When did Cambridge Analytica delete them? Uh, they relied on Cambridge Analytica telling them that all, the, all of this was gone. And until the reporting from the New York Times and the Observer last week, we didn't realize that that was not the case. Meantime, Caroline, what is the reaction in the UK where he said, I'm going to send my deputies instead? Anger came back fighting the head of the committee, which is the Committee for Digital Culture, Media and Sport here in the UK, which is investigating how fake news might have been played a role, particularly in the Brexit vote here in the UK. Well, Damien Collins, who heads up that particular committee, has come back very strongly to the news that, in fact, it will just be the CTO or the CPO, the chief product officer, that will come instead. He said, in fact, it's absolutely astonishing that Mark Zuckerberg is not prepared, he said, to submit himself to questioning 
saying urge him to think again if he has any care for people that use his company's services. He's trying to be emotional here, but to be fair to Facebook, in the letter that Damien Collins wrote back on March the 20th, he said a senior Facebook executive who they hoped would be Mark Zuckerberg. But Mark Zuckerberg obviously feels that, no, in this case, he's not the right person. The CTO, the CPO, they, the letter that Facebook sent back to Damien Collins today said, look, they're among the longest serving executives. They've got extensive background and understanding, and they're well placed to answer the committees. But interestingly, there's also this statement from Facebook. They say, look, actually, the UK and the EU shouldn't really matter to you. We can now confirm that around 1% of the global downloads of the app that came from users in the EU and the UK. Now, remember, this app, of course, is the one that was designed by Alexander Kogan, they say, of course, that was passed on from to Cambridge Analytica and therefore gave them 50 million users of Facebook. Of those 50 million users, Facebook says... Hardly any of them are from the EU or the UK, so maybe that's why Mark Zuckerberg feels he doesn't need to come in front of the parliament here. Meantime, Facebook is getting its ducks in a row to lobby lawmakers. They're hiring for 11 different positions on uh, Capitol Hill. You know, talk to us about the extent, Sarah, of Facebook's lobbying efforts as of now, how that compares to other tech companies and what they're trying to change. Well, I think the, the first thing we have to note is that Facebook's budget spent on lobbying in D.C. is so much smaller than these companies that have been doing it for years, Googles and Microsofts and Apples of the world. Um, Facebook is pretty slow to join this party. In the past, they didn't really have a very contentious relationship with Washington. They grew up in Barack Obama's presidency. Now they're sort of realizing that they need to make nice and they need to figure out how to get on, in on these issues before they come to a head. And, and most of all, how to explain their product to Congress, to lawmakers, because a lot of them don't understand the, some of the fundamental ways it works, like the fact that most ads are not purchased through human salespeople. They're purchased through this automatic advertising system. I mean, these are all things that have become very clear in the last few months. Um, but I think that you know, just like the general public, Congress has a, a lot that they want to educate. Meantime, Caroline, the controversy continues to swirl. We're learning new data to uh, new layers to the broader Cambridge Analytica story. And there is a whistleblower who worked as a contractor at Cambridge Analytica who has told Parliament basically that Brexit could have gone the other way if there hadn't been, as he calls it, cheating. You're you know, right. Give us a little bit more background on what we learned here. This is the pink-haired Christopher Wiley, who, of course, was the whistleblower for The Observer for the New York Times pieces, and he came in front of the MPs in the UK, and notably he's saying, look, potentially, as you mentioned, the Brexit vote could have gone differently if perhaps some of these related entities to Cambridge Analytica, this, of course, Cambridge Analytica disputes, I might add, but he, the Christopher Wiley is saying Cambridge Analytica's related entities were actually all mixed up in the Brexit vote, and in fact, were paid significant amounts and could have helped swing that. He also says more than 500 million people could have been affected, 50 million people could have been affected by the Cambridge Analytica data overall. And notably, he also talks about Palantir. This is a company that, you know, Peter Thiel is on the board of, which of course is on the, well, funds and is on the board of Facebook himself. Palantir could also be wrapped up in all of this, Emily. All right, Caroline Hyde for us in London, Sarah Fryer here in San Francisco. The story is not going to be going away. We're going to continue to talk about this every single day. All right. Meantime, it was another wild day for U.S. stocks with tech shares leading the market route. All the major averages posting steep losses, but the Nasdaq, of course, had the biggest declines. Our Bloomberg News stocks reporter Abigail Doolittle joins us now from New York. Abigail, this is the worst day for the Nasdaq since February 8th. Walk us through the action and what it all means. Yeah, Emily, what a day. I've been saying that a lot. I sound a little bit like a broken record, <laughs> but another roller coaster for U.S. stocks. We actually started somewhat higher, flipping between small gains and losses. Modest gains for the major averages, mid-morning to late morning, and then right around the noon, the Nasdaq started to tick lower. That led the sell-off 
leading to the worst day for both the Nasdaq and the Nasdaq 100 since February. That stands out only because last week the Nasdaq 100 had its worst week since August of 2015. But on a daily basis, none of those days were as bad as today. So the sellers are out. It really makes yesterday's rebound rally look like a dead cat bounce. And relative to the trigger for tech selling off today, which really led to the selling for all three major averages, NVIDIA, the chip maker, the shares had been nicely higher for much of the morning, the company presenting uh, at a conference. And then right around noon, Reuters was reporting that it was said that the company has decided to temporarily suspend its autonomous driving efforts. That sent those shares uh, down sharply, a leg lower, down 2 to 3 percent around that time. And then at the lows, Emily, down 10 percent. So investors not liking that cautious headline on a high-flying stock, one of tech's darlings up more than 100 percent over the last 12 months. It really seemed to be a linchpin for the tech selling because we saw names that had been higher in the morning also turning lower, such as Apple, Microsoft, Intel, just lots of bearish action. It seems as though all of the volatility right now is starting to go to the sellers slowly but surely. And a big piece of this, the tech selling, this high flying sector itself, last year's tech top sector, uh, really taking a leg lower, certainly on the year and on the day. Actually, on the year, still slightly higher, but I should say definitely on the day. So, digging for us on the FANG stocks in particular and specifically, the F, Facebook. Oh, oh, Facebook. Well, what a, you know, it's amazing what's happening with that stock. Now down about 17% on the data crisis that you all were just talking about, down five of the last seven days. Of course, the headline today around Mark Zuckerberg not helping the matter, shares down about 5%. Briefly this morning, the stock was actually higher, but then when the headline came out that Mark Zuckerberg uh, could, in fact, be testifying before Congress, investors not liking that, what could it mean around regulation, really taking the FANG trade lower along along with those NVIDIA headlines. In fact, Emily, if we hop into the Bloomberg and take a look at G hashtag BTV 476, this is the NICE FANG index. It's hard to believe this, but the degree of selling today was such that we had that FANG index down nearly 6% on the day. It's worst day going all the way back to 2014. So that's really pretty extraordinary. That's the degree of the selling pressure we're seeing today. Volatility breeds volatility, Emily. It's likely that we're going to be seeing more as the week and probably as we move into April. All right, Abigail, as you say, another extraordinary day. We'll see what you have to say tomorrow. <laughs> Coming up, Apple announces a new lower cost iPad as it aims to go head to head with Google's Chromebook in the education market. Details are next. This is Apple is making a new push to go head to head with Google in education. It is a market that Apple helped pioneer, but has let languish in recent years. At an event in Chicago Tuesday, the tech giant unveiled a new iPad that will square off with Google's cheap Chromebook laptops, as well as a new education service called Schoolwork, which will compete with Google's classroom software. Joining us from Chicago, Bloomberg Technologies, Mark Gurman. So, Mark, break it all down for us. You know, what do you think the highlights are here and where Apple uh, will be able to take on Google and not so much? Right, so when Apple was founded, 40 years ago, decades ago, and for decades after that, it was really synonymous with both creative users, internet users, but also education users. I remember growing up in school, we had Emacs back in the day, Education Max, but that sort of has languished over the past few years. Latest market share data from late last year indicated that iPhones plus iPads plus Macs had 17% of K through 12 shipments, whereas Google had a combined 60% combining Chrome OS and Android, and Microsoft had 22% of the market. So clearly there was a problem there and Apple needed to address it. So what they decided to do was go back to an iPad that they released last year. It was this $329 lower cost 9.7 inch iPad without many of the bells and whistles of the Pro models, but it was good enough for education users. Now what they're doing this year is they're updating it with a slightly faster processor, the chip from the iPhone 7 released a couple of years ago, support for the Apple Pencil, and a few other small bells and whistles with the camera and LTE speeds and such, and slapping an education label on it by putting it in this huge new education marketing push. In addition to that, they have new software, an updated version of their classroom app, a new schoolwork app for teachers and students, for students to submit their, their work. They have new curriculums to develop AR apps for their Swift programming app uh, for students. So a lot of new education software here to go along with the education hardware. 
but the bigger picture news here is the push around it. Nothing here that they announced today is very novel or breakthrough new. It's just the refocusing, the re-new marketing strategy around students, teachers, and general education. All right, Mark Gurman, our Bloomberg Tech reporter in Chicago. Thank you so much, Mark, for breaking it all down. I want to continue the discussion now with Bloomberg Gadfly Shira Oviday in New York. Shira, your column today, you're quite strong in saying that Apple may not be able to reverse its fortunes in this market. Why not? Look, you know, Mark talked about the, the market share losses that Apple's had in the education market, uh, mostly because of Google, right? This, uh, honestly, one of the undertold stories in technology of the last five years is the way that Google has managed to sweep into U.S. schools and really take over the, the computing market there. Um, I think Apple's weakness here, and, and they know this, they talked about it today, was is the software, right? That this, the big selling point of Chromebooks is not just the low cost devices, but it's this kind of ecosystem, this bundle of devices, plus all of the software that kids, teachers, and administrators need to, um, to both manage those devices and to have kids, you know, email, do, write papers, and um, get assignments from teachers and things like that. And Apple made some of those promises today, but the question is, can they deliver? Can a company whose software history is a little bit checkered, if you think about some of the failings of software like iWork, frankly, which got a refresh today, of, of iCloud, of iTunes, does Apple have the software chops and and the collaborative software chops to really go head to head with Google in education. That said, Apple wasn't first to market with a tablet or first to market with a smartphone, and then they came uh, to dominate both markets. Why couldn't something like that happen in education as well? Totally fair. I mean, it's really been a seesaw market in education really for decades that uh, Apple had a turn as the market leader, Microsoft had a turn, uh, Google has more recently had a turn. So Apple absolutely could rebound from some of their earlier uh, losses in the educational market. It's not impossible. But again, there are some weaknesses there that Google exploited on the software side and in kind of talking to teachers, using teachers as evangelists in the educational market. Um, and if Apple is focused on the education market, I think they absolutely can rebound. I'm just not sure they have the technical chops or the focus on education that they need to really um, make a go of it. All right, Bloomberg Gadfly, Shira Ovide. As always, Shira, thank you so much for stopping by. Coming up, messaging startup Intercom has pushed itself into the elite group of about 200 startups known as unicorns. This thanks to Kleiner Perkins' Mary Meeker leading its latest $125 million funding round. All of the details next. This is Bloomberg. Messaging startup Intercom just sold a pricey stake in itself. The company's latest funding round of $125 million was led by Mary Meeker of the venture capital firm Kleiner Perkins and values Intercom at $1.2 billion. That brings it into the elite group of about 200 startups known as unicorns, meaning their valuation is a billion dollars or more. And the funding comes as messaging services in general continue to gain traction, often replacing email. Joining us now with more, Intercom CEO Owen McCabe. Owen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So it's interesting, so many of these messaging companies pitch themselves as a way to, way to better communicate. This is an, in a world where we are getting more notifications and more messages than ever. So yes. what is the value proposition yes. of your product? Yes, yes, okay. Well, the way we describe ourselves is as a messaging first alternative to um, a bunch of the incumbent products like um, live chat products, marketing automation products, help desk products that, we, that are sold by the likes of Live Person or Marketo or Zendesk. Um, fundamentally, we're a customer platform for internet businesses. That doesn't really exist anything like that today. Um, and so our main value prop is that we focus on this new medium and channel. Email is just increasingly ineffective. It's been here for decades, will be here for decades, um, but modern consumers expect a substantially more fluid and personal and engaging way to connect with businesses and that's what messaging is now. Is this a replacement for email? Like do we still need email e if this <laughs> way of communicating really takes off? Yeah, like I said, email is not going anywhere. It's about dying, um, but it's here to stay, just like fax machines. 
Um, I thought those had already died. But no, I you'll find them. Not. You'll find them. <laughs> They're on their slow way out. Um, but uh, it is an augmentation um, uh, to a traditional channel like email. But you'll see just more and more people start to rely on it. One of the big bets we're making is that um, all businesses will use a modern messenger on their site or in their product. Mary Meeker says Intercom enables businesses to have a strong relationship with their customers from first touch point to repeat purchase. Its platform unifies customer data and allows sales, marketing, and support teams to have consistently high quality interactions with their customers. Who's to say a giant incumbent like Salesforce doesn't try to do what you do or buy an, a, a version of you and try to do it themselves from within? Yeah, totally. Um, we look up to Salesforce. Uh, there is nobody like them. Uh, they're cleanly on their way to a $100 billion market cap, say, for days like today. But um, all companies, and especially really big ones, have a center of gravity. They have a foundation. And everything they do, they have to lean from that place. Um, they were built 20 years ago fundamentally to serve analog businesses businesses that um, met their customers in person or on the phone. And so they'll start to stretch and do things like this, but it will take a, a newcomer to fundamentally reinvent how they work. Am I hearing you say you'd be open to an acquisition by you, Salesforce you, with all those kind words? You didn't hear anything of this. <laughs> um, so let's talk about the valuation. You know, yeah. we've been seeing some companies raise at high valuations yes. in the private markets yes. and not be able to sustain yes. them on the public yes. markets. What is the risk? there and how do you assess that risk? When we raised our first $1 million um, and we've never shared it publicly at a $6 million valuation, I was scared of that. Um, every time you go out there and put yourself out into the world, tell your best story uh, and set new goals, it's uh, intimidating. Uh, what we've always done is focus on our customers and obsess about our products and it's got us to go places and we're just going to keep doing the same. Do you think we're going to see consolidation in messaging consumer and enterprise? Like how many of these services can we really right. support? Yeah. Um, let's talk about the consumer, for example, because it's just better uh, uh, companies to point to. Mm -hmm. uh, you and I, and we met for the first time today, uh, so this is a guess. Tell me if I'm wrong. Hopefully I'm not wrong. <laughs> use so many messaging products. Yes. I use Too many. WhatsApp and Snapchat, uh, not so much anymore, Slack, <laughs> uh, iMessage, all of them. Um, so uh, there will be both consolidation, where some fail, but um, a lot of these will serve specific special use cases. Uh, Slack is great for teammates to connect, and uh, Intercom is built specifically for businesses and customers to connect. Okay. Yeah. Intercom CEO Owen McCabe, thank you for joining us. We'll have to catch up. Yes. See if you mean what you said about yes, Salesforce. Yes. Thank you. Coming up, Lyft's enterprise business has grown dramatically over the last year thanks to a surge in corporate clients. We'll speak with Lyft's chief business officer, David Baga, next. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, or in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. I'm Mark Crumpton in New York. You're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's check first word news. Japan's Nikkei News Service reports North Korean leader Kim Jong-un held talks in Beijing with Chinese President Xi Jinping. On Monday, several media outlets reported Kim's arrival on a special train similar to one used by his father for his China visit. The trip comes ahead of a planned meeting this spring with President Trump. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is expected to be released from the hospital tonight. He's being treated for an upper respiratory virus. Netanyahu, his wife and son were questioned Monday by Israeli police in a corruption case. NATO Secretary General Jen Stoltenberg says the alliance will expel seven staff from the Russian mission. The action follows this month's nerve agent poisoning of a former Russian spy in Britain. Stoltenberg says Russia has underestimated NATO. We are uh, not changing uh, our approach to Russia, which is still based on a, a dual track approach, meaning strong deterrence, defense and dialogue and we will continue to prepare for the next meeting of the NATO-Russia uh, Council. Uh, so uh, this is uh, a response. 
Demonstrators in Catalonia blocked highways and roads in central Barcelona as protests continue over the detention in Germany of former leader Carles Puigdemont. Puigdemont fled Spain for Belgium after a bid for independence was crushed by the central government in Madrid. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. here in New York, 8.30 Wednesday morning in Sydney, where my colleague Paul Allen has a look at the markets. Paul, good morning. Good morning, Mark. Uh, looking like the exact opposite of uh, yesterday, uh, this Wednesday morning in the Asia Pacific. Uh, take a look at the NZX trading for about half an hour, already off two thirds of 1% after we saw Wall Street uh, lower the Dow, S&P and NASDAQ all lower uh, by more than 2%. Uh, the NASDAQ uh, hit particularly hard, uh, concerned that Chinese investment in tech might be the next in line for trade action. Take a look at futures around the region. ASX futures lower by 1%, if that's true. The index will slip black back below 5,800 points today. Nikkei futures very modestly higher. Uh, we've seen uh, currencies take a bit of a beating as well. The Aussie dollar back below 77 cents. Quick check in on commodities. Uh, gold and oil both weaker. Oil below $65. Uh, copper one of the very few bright spots today. Well, I'm Paul Allen in Sydney. More from Bloomberg Technology next. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang. Lyft Business, the enterprise arm of the ride-hailing giant, has seen steady growth over the last year. This thanks to demand from corporate clients and an expansion into the healthcare sector. And while competition in ride-hailing is always red hot, Lyft Business has formed partnerships with Starbucks, Hewlett Packard Enterprises, and JetBlue. Here now to discuss, we are joined by David Baga, Chief Business Officer at Lyft, and this business is on track to hit a billion dollar run rate by the end of the year. What is included in that number? Is that bookings? Is that revenue? That's revenue. So That's revenue. talk to us about what is making up that revenue. You know, where is this business coming from? Yeah, so just for context, so Lyft business was started approximately three years ago. And so Lyft is uh, a little over five years old, and the mission there is to really focus on providing the world's best transportation. Lyft Business works with enterprises and organizations to provide rides for the people that they care about. So their employees, their patients, their students, and increasingly a, a wide variety of customer use cases. So we have an entire team that is sales, customer service, engineers building products and services to serve all of these use occasions for our B2B clients. For your corporate clients, are they abandoning you know, regular car services? Are they adding this on as an option? It's a combination. So you have certainly some replacement of incumbent services and ground transportation. That's out of the corporate travel space. And does do the, do these lifts operate in the same way where you hail them on demand, or are they there, you know, and can they wait just like a typical car service would? The the user experience for an, for a traveler is virtually the same as what you would get if you're a regular consumer. We do have a whole set of applications behind the scenes for corporate administrators to be able to create, design, manage, and administrate programs. And that includes ways that a lot of folks don't see that use Lyft. So we can schedule rides. You can even request a, a Lyft ride through our concierge application for somebody that doesn't even have a smartphone or the Lyft app at all. Um, you're partnering with healthcare partners. There's been some interesting data around Uber and Lyft replacing traditional ambulance services where people will call an Uber or a Lyft instead of calling an ambulance. Is an ambulance service something that you would ever partner with? In emergency situation, we always recommend calling 911 ser services. Lyft is not a replacement. What we are focused on is working with the non-emergency medical transportation providers. So every year, 3.6 million Americans miss their doctor's appointment because they don't have reliable transportation. It's a $150 billion burden on our healthcare system. And so we've partnered with uh, payers, uh, providers, and transportation brokers to be able to, to include Lyft as one of their transportation options for those folks that need a ride to the doctor's office or from when they're all done. So what do you think will sustain, and we know you've had some market share gains over the last year, especially as Uber has gone through its own struggles, what will sustain those gains and even perhaps accelerate them? 
really three things that we're focused on in the lift business. Number one is uh, remaining focused on our customer. We believe we're the leader in customer service. It, it comes from a passion to solve the problem. That's the first and foremost and something I hope we never lose sight of. The second thing is around innovation of in introducing new products. We constantly are, are faced with our clients' most challenging transportation conundrums. And we work together, roll up our sleeves, and oftentimes that means designing brand new products that we roll out to the rest of our clients and opening up new industries completely. And the third is, is really about uh, being able to hire really great people and co to continue up with our growth rate. So speaking of innovation and new products, you know, we've been talking a lot about self-driving cars. I know this is a different division uh, than yours at Lyft, but we've been talking about it every single day for the last week given the Uber self-driving crash. This is something that Lyft is also pursuing mainly through partnerships, um, but other avenues as well. Uber is saying they're not going to renew their permit to test self-driving cars in California. We expect that regulators may take a pause given some of what we've seen, especially over the last week. How will that impact Lyft's self-driving efforts and partnerships? In the news, it, it was incredibly saddening to all of us, and our condolences go out to the victims and their loved ones. For, for Lyft, we remain entirely focused on safety as our number one priority for our self-driving initiative. So how do you make, make sure that is a priority, especially given the way that you're pursuing self-driving cars via partnerships? Well, today we are testing and designing and developing our self-driving system, but we don't currently have any cars on the road. Do you think that this will fundamentally hold back self-driving efforts overall, or do you think that ultimately we're going to get to a, a place where this is mainstream and this is safe? Ultimately, I do believe that we are going to see self-driving deliver the benefits that we've talked about for the last several years. I do think that this is going to be a pause and allow uh, regulators and the technology suppliers and, and participants to really take a hard look at what is the path to making them a viable, widely spread option. So, you know, given all of the different businesses that Lyft is experimenting with and building out mm -hmm. like, like yours, um, I wonder if self-driving, not self-driving, uh, ride-sharing becomes a commodity and whether, you know, the choice between Uber and Lyft or whatever ride-sharing service it is, is simply comes down to ultimately how far away is the, is the fastest car that I can get. We have seen that, that coverage matters and ETAs definitely matter and, and pricing is, is critical importance to may, remain competitive. But we do think that there are a, a values also matter and that that's an important factor that we're seeing introduced into the criteria for decision making for consumers and certainly showing up for my B2B clients. All right, David Baga, Lyft Chief Business Officer. I know you're working on some exciting partnerships, which you'll have to come back and talk to us again. Uh, thank you so much thank for, you for stopping by. All right, Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is making his first official visit to the United States since becoming heir to the throne. And Prince Mohammed is traveling to the West Coast later this week to meet with some of the biggest firms. For more now, we are joined by Bloomberg Tech reporter Olivia Zaleski. So, Olivia, what do we know about the trip and who he will be visiting? Yeah, Emily, this is an exciting, if not somewhat controversial moment in the tech industry's history. On Friday, uh, the Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman, will first visit Seattle and he'll meet with Amazon's Jeff Bezos and then um, Microsoft's Satya Nadella. He'll also meet with executives from Boeing and then he'll head over to LA where he'll meet with the big movie execs uh, as well as some um, executives from Hyperloop and Snap. And then he'll come to Silicon Valley where he'll meet with Google, Uber, and um, uh, an Apple. So why such a focus on technology companies for this trip in particular? Well, I think the Crown Prince is really trying to diversify Saudi Arabia away from oil investments. Um, you know, the technology industry uh, presents an exciting opportunity. It also presents an opportunity for employment for his people. There are a lot of young people, they need jobs. So he's eager to ink some deals while he's here to bring these U.S. tech companies over to Saudi Arabia. And what do we know about the kinds of deals in particular that he's looking for? 
You know, we, we understand that he's really focused on getting some data centers in place. So uh, today, for example, Google uh, inked a deal saying that they would provide um, cloud uh, services to Saudi Aramco. Uh, we also understand that he's been pushing Amazon to put in some cloud services there. So he wants a more robust um, data services operation. Um, we also understand that he's been pressuring some of these tech companies to build offices in Saudi Arabia's capital. Talk to us about the controversy surrounding these deals because they don't come without a little bit of baggage, especially given the dollar amounts that we're talking about here. Yeah, it was really interesting reporting this story because every company that we reached out to said no comment. They didn't want to talk about it. They didn't want to engage on the matter. Um, we even understand that some CEOs asked not to be photographed with the crown prince. So it's very controversial that he's here and that he's taking these meetings. And I think, you know, he doesn't, um, he has sort of a reputation for being a tyrant. You know, recently he imprisoned um, several of Saudi Arabia's top businessmen in the um, Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Riyadh. And, um, um, you know, he has been criticized for the bombing in Yemen as well. Also, uh, Saudi Arabia's treatment of women is a, a very controversial topic, and it's, it's a hot topic right now in Silicon Valley, especially where there's a lot of sensitivity to how tech companies treat women. All right, Olivia Zaleski, thank you so much for your reporting on this. I know we'll be covering that visit by the hour. All right, coming up, Google Cloud could Google, excuse me, could owe Oracle one massive check. We look at the case that has Silicon Valley watching. That is next. This is Bloomberg. could owe Oracle up to $9 billion for inappropriately using Java code in its Android operating system. An appeals court ruled that Google's use of Oracle-owned Java programming code went too far when it was developing Android. That number could grow even more in a case that date back, dates back to 2010. The case could have far-reaching implications for the software industry, and it has divided Silicon Valley for years over the concept of fair use in programming. To get further into the legal weeds of this case, I'd like to turn to Bloomberg Intelligence's Matt Larson, who covers tech litigation. This case was filed the year before Bloomberg Technology, or Bloomberg West, as it was called then, was founded. So we have been covering this every single year. Both Google and Oracle have won, lost, appealed. Where are we now? Yeah, yeah. So we are we're on the third go around now between appeals and trial. Uh, the as you said, the case was filed in 2010. There was a trial. There was an appeal. There was another trial. There was an appeal. Now we've gotten to the point where uh, it looks like Google may petition the Supreme Court. Uh, they were on the losing end of the last round of appeals, in which the uh, as you said, the court ruled that their use of the Java APIs was not fair use, and that there was no defense to the infringement, and that it needs to go back to the trial court to decide what damages are owed Oracle, if any. Who has a better case? Right now we view that Oracle has, has the better case, uh, especially in view of some of the appellate decisions that have come out. One of the things that's cloud this, this legal case is it keeps going back and forth. You know, Google will uh, secure a victory or a partial victory, Oracle will appeal, the appeals court will side with Oracle. Uh, so the, the legal ground is, is shifting a little bit, but at this at this juncture, we think that Oracle has the better case, and they're certainly due some compensation for having developed the platform, uh, the, the, the code that's given rise to the Android platform. Talk to us about the broader implications of this fair use idea and why it has been so closely watched in tech. It has a lot of implications for software developers. The idea that, that companies are grappling with is where does ownership begin and where does it end? When are, when are these coding um, structures available for use for everyone. Uh, Oracle made the, the APIs available for developers uh, of kind of specific applications to run on a platform, but not necessarily for commercially competitive products. And so software companies now are grappling with, well, where's the difference? Where can we make something uh, kind of open source and allow people to build off an existing platform versus where can we start to use known techniques or existing structures to develop uh, commercially competitive products? And so that's what the industry is looking at. So 
what's next? And do you expect this to go to the Supreme Court? <laughs> I, th I, think, I think Google will certainly try. They attempted to go to the Supreme Court during the last go around in which they were challenging whether or not these, uh, these API, the application program interfaces, were, were even protectable by copyright. Uh, the Supreme Court shut that down. They let the Federal Circuit's decision stand. So we anticipate Google will do a couple things. They might ask a larger panel of appellate judges to look at the decision. They may go to the Supreme Court, or if both those get shut down, it'll go back to, uh, to court before Judge Alsop here in Northern California. All right, well, $8.8 .8 billion at stake, but of course, that entire judgment wouldn't necessarily be paid. It could just be part of that, Could right? be part, and it's, you know, it's worth it to pay the lawyers and roll the dice at this point. <laughs> All right, Matt Larson of Bloomberg Intelligence, thank you so much for stopping by. All right, Netflix is stirring up some controversy in Brazil. A hashtag delete Netflix campaign has burst forth on Twitter since The Mechanism, a fictional show based on the real-life multi-year corruption probe dubbed Car Wash, was added to the streaming service on Friday. Former President Dilma Rousseff, who was impeached in 2016 amid fallout from the scandal, called the show underhanded and full of lies. Coming up, software company Okta was a tech IPO success story last year. What CEO Todd McKinnon learned from going public? Next, this is Bloomberg. Apollo Global Management is considering an IPO of cloud computing company Rackspace. That's according to people with knowledge of the matter. The private equity firm has held early talks with investors and advisors and may seek to begin the process before the end of the year. Rackspace could have an enterprise value of as much as $10 billion in a U.S. listing. Meantime, software firm Okta has had a successful run since going public a little less than a year ago. The stock is up 45% so far this year, thanks to steady demand within the data security industry. Our Caroline Hyde caught up with Okta CEO Todd McKinnon in London to talk about the road to going public. We were never looking to be bought, uh -huh. but people were always interested in us, but we, we always wanted to be an independent company that, that went public. Okay. Um, and for us, really what drove it was a couple things. One is that, and this was surprising to me as an entrepreneur and as a CEO, um, a big factor was employees, right? We compensated employees partly in stock, mm -hmm. and going public was the best way to help them realize that compensation. There was also big uh, gains in terms of customer perception. What we do is we really sell a service that's about trust and security mm. and to be a listed company uh, w when you're selling to the largest organizations in the world it really helps that message your your financials are audited they know you have they can see you know they can see your business is successful and they can see you have real staying power and it helps that them make what what's a very important purchase for them with more confidence interesting we're seeing bit of a rise of IPOs in the tech world. We've yeah. got Dropbox just went Still public. relatively few, though, overall. You think? Yeah, what, what compared about to past, compared to past norms. Do you think that will pick up? Uh, well, I think there's a couple things at play. One is that in the last five years or so, or really the last 10 years, the venture capital and late stage rounds has been so prevalent. A lot of these companies, you know, it used to be it was so in, in, in a quaint old time, you went public because you needed money, right? But now these companies could raise so much money privately. I mean, Dropbox uh, raised hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars privately. They never had to go public. Mm. Um, but now you're seeing more and more companies kind of come to that maturity where they can go public. What about Spotify listing but not having an IPO as such, not raising new money? Do you think that's something that could catch on? Yeah, well, I think it's, you know, different companies are, are do it for different reasons, but it's kind of back to what I was saying about, um, you know, another reason to go public is to let your employees or other shareholders reap, reap some of the rewards of investing in you. And, yeah, you, they're kind of doing that without having to raise any more money, which I, I can't speak to the spe specific reasons why they chose that, but it a little, is a little bit non-traditional. You talked about it just earlier, how going public helped with the fact that you're all about trust and about yes. security. Talk to us about trust and security at the moment in the time where all we can talk about is Facebook, the yeah. data of 50 million Americans getting into the hands of Cambridge Analytica, the fight they're fighting at the moment. How 
are you seeing the focus on data and on privacy affecting your business? Yeah, well, it's, it, it is truly on everyone's mind. One of the big things that's really accelerated our business in the last three or four years is that when we started it, I, identity management and security, they were a little bit, you know, the people in IT would worry about it, but they, were, they weren't prevalent in the top levels of organizations. Now, security and privacy is really a board level conversation. And every board in every industry has two pressures that in a lot of times uh, are kind of opposite, right? One pressure is they have to connect with their customers more. They have to provide better websites, better services, better mobile apps, which means collecting more data and providing a better value to their customers, right? More personalized, more specific to them. On the other hand, they have to be more secure and they have to make sure that they are not breached. They have to make sure that they can provide the privacy controls and comply with regulations like GDPR. So a lot of times those things are at odds and it's hard to do both. And uh, now every board, every, every leadership team in every industry is trying to figure out how to do both of those things and that's where we can help them. GDPR is the general data protection regulation that's coming into place in the EU May the 25th. Yeah. How do you view that regulation? Because that's going to make privacy that much more important. It's, yeah. it, it really does give more power back to the consumer. Yeah. And in fact, if Facebook was going through what it had done, if, if what had occurred at Facebook yeah. had occurred today, or indeed in post May 25th, they could have racked up significant fines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how is it that affecting your clients? And do you I think, think it's, it's the right sort of regulation? I think. It, I mean, I think the it's great for the industry. I mean, it really it does something very simple, which I think is very powerful. It, it raises the conversation and gives us a way to talk about these things and what, what is sufficient controls and who controls what. I mean, that's a pretty simple concept that our industry, I don't think, has really wrestled with enough. And just by having these regulations and, and having this, these, this vernacular on how we talk about this um, really gives us the conversation to really figure some of these problems out. That was Okta CEO Todd McKinnon with Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde in London. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. A reminder, we're live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology Weekdays, 5 p.m. New York, 2 p.m. San Francisco. That is all for now. This is Bloomberg.